Good morning. Good morning from Kyoto, Japan. I'm Connie Book, president of Elon University in North Carolina, USA, and chair of the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities in the United States. That organization represents 1,000 private and independent colleges. This is my second time at IGF and the 12th time that Elon University has sent a delegation to this important global gathering. Our engagement at IGF since 2006 has been through our Imagining the Internet Center. It is Elon's public research initiative focused on the impact of the digital revolution uh, and what it, it does and impact on individuals and institutions. We have a booth over in the village and our team is recording video interviews at IGF. And I encourage you to take a few moments to stop by and share your thoughts with us at some point this week. Today's launch event highlights the urgent issues related to artificial intelligence and higher education. We are releasing a substantive position statement titled, Higher Education's Essential Role in Preparing Humanity for the Artificial Intelligence Revolution. If you work at a college or university, you know how timely and important this statement is. The statement introduces six holistic principles and calls for higher education community to be included as an integral partner in AI development and AI governance. The statement provides a framework for leaders at, at colleges and universities around the world as they develop strategies to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. At Elon University, faculty are adapting the statement as they create policies on AI and design new approaches to teaching and learning. In writing this statement, we worked with higher ed leaders, scholars, and faculty members from around the world to synthesize ideas from authoritative sources on AI. I want to thank everyone who spent time considering this statement and contributing their thoughts and support. Today, more than 130 distinguished academic leaders and organizations from 42 countries are initial signatories to the document, and we invite you to join them. Study the document on our website and sign on if you wish. There are printed copies available for those in the room today, and our moderator will post a link for remote participants. Let's briefly look at these six principles. First, principle number one, people, not technology, must be at the center of our work. As we adapt to AI, human health, dignity, safety, and privacy, must be our first considerations. Two, digital inclusion is essential in the age of AI. We must be an advocate and ensure people at our universities and colleges and beyond gain access to these technologies and be educated about AI. Principle three, Digital and information literacy is no longer optional for universities. We must prepare all learners, no matter what their discipline, to learn and act responsibly with AI and other digital tools. Digital literacy gives us power, and that must be part of every post-secondary education. Principle number four, teaching and learning is already undergoing dramatic change because of AI, and we must carefully navigate the use of these tools in education, using them transparently and wisely, and protecting the interest of students and faculty members. Principle number five, we are just at the beginning of the AI revolution, so we must prepare all learners for a lifetime of growth. 
and help them gain hands-on skills to adapt to accelerating change. Principle six. This final principle has to do with AI research and development, research conducted at high, in higher education institutions around the world. These powerful technologies carry great rewards and great risk, and therefore, great responsibility. We need strong policies in place to guard against negative consequences of digital tools that could go beyond human control. These are our core principles, and this sets the stage for a great discussion by our distinguished panelists today. After their remarks, we will open the floor for all to share their thoughts on higher education's role in advancing the future of humanity in the AI age. Let's begin with Mr. Lee Rainey who spent the past 24 years as Director of Internet and Technology Research at the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C. We're very excited that Lee has joined Elon University to lead our continuing research on imagining the digital future. Lee, please get us started today. Thank you so much, President Book. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to be associated with this really important initiative. We believe that the six principles uh, for the internet and artificial intelligence in our global petition are essential for maintaining human rights, human autonomy, and human dignity. The principles bring time-tested truths to the age of artificial intelligence. There is evidence aplenty that societies advance as their educational systems emphasize how people's adoption of new skills can help them become smarter, as people discover new ways to create, connect, and share, as diverse populations are given the wherewithal to control how new technologies are used, and as people adjust their lives to the emerging practices that the new technologies afford, including lifelong learning. As President Book noted, we at Elon University think that institutions of higher education can be the vanguard of civil society forces that enable beneficial changes for humanity. Since the earliest universities were created centuries ago, they have cultivated the grandest purposes of humankind, discovering and advancing knowledge, training leaders, promoting active citizenship, and yes, critiquing the societies around them and sounding warnings as troubles loom. Importantly, we know that as technology revolutions spread, one of the major jobs of universities is to pass along the best ideas and most effective strategies for learning new literacies, especially to other institutions and those involving children in particular. Clearly, we are at a singular moment now as AI spreads through our lives. In the past, tools and machines were created to enhance or surpass physical capacities of humans. The advent of AI for the first time brings technologies that enhance or surpass our cognitive capacities. This revolution will cause a big sort that will force us humans to identify and exploit the traits and talents that are unique to us and make us distinctively valuable. What will be the differentiators between what we can do and what our machines can do? How can we domesticate these technologies to make sure they serve us and not the other way around? At Elon, we are planning to be in the forefront of university studying and disseminating insights about a, how AI is affecting people. We have an ambitious agenda of fresh research that will build on several decades of exploration of digital trends and future pathways for digital innovation. In fact, we are gathering data right now in a survey of experts and a separate survey of the general population in the United States to explore, explore how both groups' views about possible benefits and harms of artificial intelligence are going to unfold in the coming years. We will be releasing those findings in early 2024. Beyond that research, the, these are some of the questions that will guide our work in the age of artificial intelligence, metaverses, and smart environments. 
What are the new literacies that people would be wise to learn? They might include things like media and information literacy, the accuracy and, and inaccuracy of information, judging it and making the right decisions based on it. Data literacy, privacy literacy, algorithmic literacy, creative and content creation literacy. In addition, we at Elon seem destined to explore how well we are doing to hone our singular, valuable human characteristic. It means things like problem solving, and hierarchical decision making that makes pattern connections and makes decision trees about how to move forward. Critical thinking, sophisticated communication, and the ability to persuade, which machines can't yet do. The application of collective intelligence and teamwork, especially in diverse environments. The benefits of grit and a growth mindset. Flexibility, especially in fluid creative environments. And emotional resilience. In the end, big issues await exploration. What are the signposts and measures of human intelligence? What are the qualities leaders must possess? How do people live lives of meaning and autonomy? What is the right relationship between us and our ever more powerful digital tools? Our past studies have shown that there are a wide range of answers to questions like those. And yet there, are universal, there is a universal purpose driving people's answers. They want us to think together to devise solutions that yield the greatest possible achievements with the least possible pain. Thank you so much for your interest. Please feel free to reach out to me here or find me in our booth in the exhibit hall. Where if you're interested in furthering this campaign, signing uh, the, our petition, and maybe getting involved with us, we are always on the hunt for new partners, new collaborators, and new ideas. Again, my thanks, President Book. Thank you, Lee. We now have two distinguished speakers who are joining us remotely. First is Professor Davina Fraumigs, who helped with the research and writing of this statement and connected us with thought leaders around the world. She teaches and researches at Sorbonne Nouvelle University in Paris and has been quite active for years with UNESCO and at IGF. Dr. Fraumigs, you're up. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for um, having me uh, so far away. It's two o'clock in the morning in Paris, uh, but it's really worth it <laughs> to be uh, with you and for me to, to return to IGF uh, as I saw it being born uh, since I participated uh, in the World Summit on Information Society in, in 2005, representing uh, academia for the Civil Society uh, Bureau uh, of the summit. And I've, I've worked on this, these topics uh, ever since and, and followed ever since from uh, uh, the beginning of social media in 2005 to what we could call now the beginning of synthetic uh, media. And this is uh, maybe one of the, the tags I will take. I wanted to thank uh, before that um, uh, um, Jaina and um, Daniel uh, Anderson, as well as Lee Rainey and the Elon um, University for including me in, uh, in drafting uh, the document and um, fine tuning it. And uh, I want to stress the importance also of um, IMCR, my NGO, the International Association for Media and Research, uh, that is a, a UNESCO um, uh, observer status uh, NGO, which has supported uh, fully all members uh, the, the statement uh, and added um, a statement of its own. And I think, I hope that one of the uh, impacts of uh, this uh, big statement by um, by us all a contribution to IGF will also encourage other entities to to make their own and because we each and all have to appropriate and what we feel is going on with the internet and and make sure that the cultural diversity of our universities uh, uh, continues uh, so that we don't um, fall under two uh, problems um, uh, one which would be a uh, kind of homogeneity uh, brought by the control of some sources and some uh, it types of AI models uh, uh, in the world and therefore creating more digital divides. And the other one, which is something I think we all feel uh, is um, 
that as researchers, we, we have to resist the panic, uh, the, the current panic about uh, AI systems and the fact that they could produce a super intelligence that uh, is uh, more intelligent than us. I think we all agreed um, as we discussed and, and went um, around the world and that um, this has to remain human centered and that actually the humanities have a, a possibility of being back and not just STEM uh, as a field and because uh, more than ever, we need to be uh, human centered and get down to uh, what uh, it really is to be, uh, to be human. So uh, I represent also, it's true, a network of researchers at UNESCO called MILID, the, the Media and Information Literacy and Intercultural Dialogue um, Network of universities where we also try to, to think these items. Uh, we push, of course, for um, um, media and information literacy first uh, because it uh, um, permits um, a kind of familiarity that allows us then to move to AI literacy. And so one of the focuses uh, uh, that of how to go about it for us would be go with familiarity so that people don't have the feeling there's a huge gap uh, before uh, getting all these uh, competences. And so, um, so as to prevent the panic and on, on the contrary, um, leave a, a space for uh, understanding and for um, adoption, uh, we need to lift uh, fear and, and anxiety. And uh, for that, um, we have to go also at the policy level. And um, I think for, for us, we would emphasize, and that's the nice things about the six items that we've put in there, they can all be unpacked. They can all be unpacked and updated. Uh, so if I were to unpack and update uh, our work uh, in a sort of continuous way, uh, I would say that um, um, one of the uh, most important things is proper guardrails uh, for teachers and students. And we know and research has shown that the guardrails proposed currently by AI systems, uh, tech companies uh, can be bypassed. So this is a problem. And uh, we as universities have to come up with our solutions for teachers and learners worldwide. Uh, also, uh, we need um, explainable AI. It's probably one of the most important elements uh, because we have to uh, have access to the motivations for creating AI systems, for uh, funding AI, for the validity of uh, the, the, the AI, the, the fact that uh, the, the scraping of the data has to be lawful, unbiased, uh, safe because that's how we can make proper decision making. And we know at the moment that there's, there's no really ethically sourced data. They're not consensual. The models of data scraping are not consensual, especially uh, in certain parts of the world like, uh, like Europe where I come from and uh, where we have a feeling that uh, there is a, a lot of violation. And for us uh, at university and uh, in research and teaching, uh, source um, uh, reliability and uh, ethically sourced data are crucial. We, we must, we can't let go uh, fake, fake information, fake news, in, including those uh, proposed by synthetic media that are coming up uh, um, without being scared about what happens uh, with proliferation of pseudosciences. And this undermines uh, the, the whole uh, remit of our university and, and our research approaches. And so uh, I would call on a lot of reflection on, on source reliability, because we probably are in facing a new kind of source, uh, a, a source that is not a primary source nor a secondary source and with, uh, with uh, these intelligence um, uh, AI models. So um, these are elements that I wanted to, to put into the, the discussion. And uh, um, soon, uh, at the moment, is under embargo because it's not out yet, uh, but UNESCO will release during Media and Information Literacy Week um, at the end of October in Jordan, will release um, uh, the approach, uh, its approach on uh, uh, AI and, uh, and media and information literacy. And uh, I hope you'll see that it buttresses everything that is uh, uh, being done here. Clearly, at IGF level, uh, we would support, I think, all of us, the creation of a body on information and AI, 
information and AI with all stakeholders and especially, uh, of course, uh, universities and researchers, and because we probably are the, the best place to facilitate and the, the, the relatively um, asymmetrical dialogue right now and between the uh, ed tech companies and the, uh, the AI ed techs uh, that are becoming extremely proprietary, extremely uh, commercial, and what we would like to have as independent uh, research uh, spaces um, uh, that are uh, universities uh, and uh, policy uh, policy making uh, spaces. So um, definitely if at uh, IGF, you guys who are there could push uh, for the creation of a, a global body of this kind, uh, but is actually more or less being uh, um, um, delineated uh, at UN, but uh, IGF could be a very good space for um, continuous discussion about uh, these, um, these items that I've un underlined, uh, like source reliability, AI explainability, and of course, all of this within uh, um, our human, very human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frau Miggs. Lots to consider there. Thank you for those thoughtful remarks. We are honored today to be joined by Internet Hall of Fame member Alejandro Passanti. Dr. Passanti is a legendary leader in global internet governance circles. He is a professor of internet governance at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Dr. Passanti, please give us your thoughts on the future role of higher education in the AI age. Thank you, Professor uh, Book. Uh, can you hear me well? Um, uh, sorry, I, it is awful manners uh, to begin a speech by correcting the previous speaker, but legend, that's Divina from Mike's, that's Elon University, legend, that's Jana Anderson and Lee Rainey, uh, and I don't want to continue with the list because it's very long. Uh, I'm very honored and I hope, Professor Book, that uh, you realize uh, how uh, highly uh, many of us think of the effort that Elon University has, uh, has done. You really made a world uh, worthy mark uh, with uh, Jan Anderson's and Lee Rainey's work with the Internet Governance Forum. They have done so much uh, from having students over documenting by video things that no one even thought were worth recording. And now they are that document. Uh, to their deep thoughts and understanding, their identifying leaders, uh, bringing young people who, have, who I followed a few of them, of your former students who have become really brilliant media analysts or figures or communicators. So uh, they, they have increased the aura of Elon University to immense heights. This is really, really wonderful. So thank you for- Thank you, Dr. Pesanti, that's work. very nice. Thank that's, you. Uh, that's really amazing. Uh, I come from a very large university. Uh, we, it, it, it's very hard for us not to look at things uh, through a lens of size. And Elon is especially remarkable when, when we see that you have done far more uh, than universities like mine with uh, uh, probably 20 times as many students as, as, as you have. We have uh, uh, two, we have two zeros to your, to your numbers. Uh, I want to, uh, enter now the, 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 the subject matter of this speech, make it very brief and, and try to make it concise. Uh, first, I, I join uh, Divina from Mike's mom. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of my most admired figures in this, in, in this world from, from the era that she, she has mentioned, from the, from the early times of the World Summit on the Information Society, when people like her and IEMCR uh, were championing these alternative views to state-controlled uh, media or to the large private interests. At the time, it was mostly media and uh, carriers, uh, network operators who, who needed opposing. And we have now a much broader spectrum and a much more complex one because we simultaneously need to oppose and platformize uh, many of the uh, entities that are now uh, considered troublesome. I want to join her statement in particular of uh, resisting the panic. I think that the first thing that universities have to do, universities and schools all over, is sober up and tell everybody, sober up, calm down, cool down, look at this rationally. 
what are we if not the supposed depositories of rationality, of rational thought, not of the truth, but of the way of approaching whatever becomes the truth and letting it be built on fact and reason. And that's, I think, the, the very first thing. I have a second uh, question here for the universities. I, uh, I want to thank Jana Anderson and Leon, Jana particularly, because she made much of the follow-up for sharing with me drafts, early drafts of the statement that has uh, now become the, the statement for this. Uh, and uh, I was a little bit shocked at the beginning because I thought uh, it was leaving the universe, conceiving the universities in a very partial and uh, small role in a corner of things where they should be part of the mainstream and even the leading edge of things. Uh, first world universities, let me abbreviate things by, by, short, by, by calling just advanced economy or first world universities, are seeing now what we have suffered in developing countries for decades, if not centuries, which is a brain drain. One of the things that you are so concerned about comes from the fact that AI development pays a lot better in companies than it does in universities. Universities were sort of the Santa Santorum where even the winters were wintered, were weathered out. Even the several AI winters were weathered out by universities where, you know, this slow research kept going on. Algorithms were developed. Uh, the mathematics was developed, not only the, the computational technique, but the, the basic math of neural networks was developed in, in academia. And we're suddenly out of uh, our best people because they are working for companies which have not only large funding, but the other thing that drives researchers, the opportunity to actually do it. Uh, when our researchers leave, when our PhD students leave for the US or for uh, Europe or Japan, they don't not, they're not only looking for a place which will pay a better salary, but they're looking for a lab that is actually equipped for work, where they can actually do the measurements, do the experiments, get them published its significance, its impact, it's actually doing the thing that moves them. And you are suffering the same thing now. There's just a new echelon of that. So the question here, and, and I'll stop with that question for, for, for this intervention, is the most expensive thing we have in developing countries is the, 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 the highest cost we incur in is the cost of not doing. The cost of not having developed a solid academic system with tenure, with infrastructure, with diversity, the cost of not uh, developing a government that is rationally driven, uh, that creates policies with continuity on, a, on an evidence basis, uh, that invokes rights, uh, invokes pragmatism. We never know where we actually are. So rights are involved as a way of pulling the handbrake instead of finding the way of calling rights uh, for not for the other guys to go faster, but for us to be able to go as fast or faster. So that cost of not doing is now being clearly manifested in the shortcomings that the universities are trying to uh, overcome with this statement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pisanti. Really interesting. Calm down, cool down. <laughs> um, so next we have Dr. Francisca Oladipo, Vice Chancellor and Professor of Computer Science at Thomas Adewami University in Nigeria. Dr. Oladipo. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity, Ellen University. Um, speaking from uh, the perspective of uh, an African university and an African researcher, we were probably just still catching up with the rest of the world. But then you look at it with uh, an emerging technology or like everyone else experiencing something new for the first time, there is that risk of uh, a wrong adoption or even possibility of abuse. And so I believe that universities, most of our roles should be centered around uh, the educational aspect of artificial intelligence of AI. So if you look at not just interdisciplinary education, but also interdisciplinary collaboration, AI is applicable in practical every field. So AI researchers should not think of just collaborating with uh, subject level experts, but Students in the field of AI should be made to study 
other subjects like philosophy, finance, healthcare, uh, social sciences to give some basic kind of domain knowledge. And universities also need to promote ethical artificial intelligence and do a lot of education around ethical AI because uh, students are to, to, you know, to, to kind of guide against that abuse and misuse. And then uh, there's, there are a lot of questions in the society about the role of AI in education and on the educational space. So not just educating the student, but also there's a need to educate the society generally, maybe through seminars or handbills or, you know, to have a town and gown on uh, artificial intelligence. The curriculum, these days needs to be centered around AI because whether we like it or not, it's going to be with us for a very long time. I mean, it's always been here, but the awareness is now higher. So most of the curriculum, whether it's in the humanities or in the arts or sciences and technology, even medicine needs to build around AI to ensure that AI literacy for everyone. Universities, we need to do a lot of advocacy to engage with policy makers the issue of um, we, we can con contribute our expertise to responsible artificial intelligence in governance, but how can we effectively do this if we don't engage with policymakers and do a lot of public outreach? We must continue to promote more diversity and inclusion. In Nigeria, we see AI as more of, oh, it's for you computer people but it is no longer the case. Students in arts, they use chat GPT now to get answers. They use uh, other uh, online AI tools for one reason to listen to research papers and so on. So there is always that indirect application of AI across every field. And so we need to be more inclusive to embrace everyone and not make AI look more like uh, it's for computing people. When we talk about AI for social good, the people primarily at the center of ensuring social good are mainly in the arts and humanities. They're the ones that study behavior, they're the ones that uh, look into issues and how factors affect people uh, due to different reasons. So it is important that these people are also included in the study of AI. There is a need for every one of us to engage in continuous learning. The fast pace at which AI is emerging now with the large language models and before we know it, something new is out there. We all need to continue to learn to keep up, keep abreast and be able to educate others. Thank you all very much for this opportunity again. I'm sorry it's uh, 1 to 3 a.m. in Nigeria and... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's very, very late, I know. Dr. Aladipo, thank you. Now, joining us remotely from India is Dr. Siva Prasad Rambi Hatla. He is a retired professor and leader of the Center for Digital Learning, Training, and Resources at the University of Hyderabad. Dr. Rambi Hatla, Very, very good morning or good night, good afternoon, wherever we are. Uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Professor Yana Anderson for this opportunity. Uh, I, I let me, uh, because I am an anthropologist, so I look at it slightly differently. Uh, we, uh, you see, technology is a medium uh, which uh, we as humans feed into it, we as humans guide it. And our biases also are put into it through algorithms and other things. Now, when I'm looking at uh, the field of education, commodifying education is one of the challenges that makes access to a large number of people uh, who have been denied on account of their economic, poor economic condition. And if you really look at the statistics of, it, of education uh, in many countries, especially in the global south, because we must remember there is large uh, kind of disparity between global south and global north. So the global south, if you look at it, those who have no access to education are from the disadvantaged sections. 
during especially very interesting thing was during COVID-19, digital technology, especially you know, using uh, all uh, uh, kind of online education uh, technologies played a very uh, interesting role. In fact, after that, uh, online uh, presentations all that became a, a kind of a commonality and uh, AI and uh, 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 other technologies are really useful in this. So what uh, we find is uh, this itself has thrown up new challenges uh, for the academics. And uh, when I'm saying new challenges to academics, uh, you find major problem that lies in the digital divide. The access to uh, the, uh, the uh, equipment, access to the technology. And many of the people, especially children and others, during COVID time when they were uh, trying to access, they never had, uh, you know, broadband, uh, the, the bandwidth connectivity and all that. Some of them even were climbing trees to catch the signals. And it was such a horrible thing. So apart from that, online courses are also need to be designed and articulated in a way that captures the minds of the uh, learners. That is also a big challenge. And what we find, uh, is the lack of skills and ability to design courses using multimedia or even uh, you know uh, your uh, uh, the 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 kind of new technologies that are there, especially like ChatGPT and other things which are people are using it. That is where we find uh, you know designing them in an imaginative way to keep the attention of the learners is an important thing, and. That is where we even try to train the teachers or the uh, persons who are designing the courses. That is where capacity building was one of the important things that we need to undertake. Which means we need many specialists, including experts from the visual media, to sensitize the online uh, uh, content and course developers. And this is where AI technology is trying to fill the lacune of shortage of teachers or shortage of instructors, because the moment you design it carefully and it can fill the gap, but it doesn't fill the human gap. It is only fills the partly knowledge gap. So the challenge posed today uh, is from the generative AI, especially ChatGPT and ChatGPT4. And this challenges the use of issues of copyright, plagiarism, and other related issues. In fact, plagiarism, uh, there are some uh, tools developed even to capture uh, whether the content is taken from uh, uh, the other sources, online sources. In fact, that is where also the problems and others have mentioned. Copyrights, apart from the data of sovereignty, data uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, importance or in the kind of uh, security. So this is where what is what this uh, chat GPT and others are doing is they are impeding the creative thinking among the younger learners because they don't, uh, they try to bypass the process of learning. Just the copy, they can ask ChatGPT, give me this and that day. The content writing becomes easier for them, but then it doesn't help one to think over. So the challenges are real and they require multidisciplinary approaches. And in fact, another important thing is if education has to be inclusive and multicultural, and knowledge to be more, uh, it has to be more local. We need to have a local AI models of learning. Because that is local AI models of learning because the subject is not, there can't be universal kind of a uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, content because most of the things are local. Therefore, what we need is a local knowledge, so local contents and that need to be given in order to make people to learn better about it because problems are all local and solutions can be only local. They emerge from local knowledges. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ram Bahadla. Next to speak is Wei Wang, a doctoral student at the University of Hong Kong School of Law and member of the IGF Dynamic Coalition on Data and Artificial Intelligence Governance. He is also a teaching fellow at the FGV Think Tank in Brazil. Dr. Wang. 
Uh, thank you so much, Chair, and uh, I mean, thank you so much for having me here, and uh, I mean, thank you so much for everybody for coming. Uh, I, I think, um, yes, I'm so sorry that I cannot be physically with you together, uh, together with you in Japan, and, but I'm feeling excited to be here I mean, virtually. Um, actually, there, um, I will probably brief you uh, with some legal aspect, but before moving to the legal aspect of, uh, I mean, AI's uh, implications upon higher education, I think I will have some very general points as well. Actually, as you, as the chair have mentioned that we will, we are, I'm currently in the dynamic connection on data and AI governance and we will release a research, the ever first research report on um, sort of, I mean, global AI governance, I mean, landscape uh, as well, probably tomorrow. So if you're uh, uh, interested in this uh, topic, you can probably get some hard copy at IGF as well. Um, and uh, in that uh, research report, some of my colleagues propose a sort of uh, this data supply chain of artificial intelligence. And this, uh, and this sort of uh, supply chain is relevant to at least three legal aspects. The first is what we call data protection for sure. Uh, uh, as you may know that um, some generative AI services are using personal data for training Right, and this definitely this has triggered a lot of data protection authorities globally to investigate those uh, generated AI services like uh, uh, Italy. I think it's the ever first authority to investigate this uh, generative AI services. And the second uh, area is the so-called content safety, a misinformation, disinformation, and, uh, and the most significant area is that what we call machine hunteration. Uh, that means you, uh, uh, right, um, for example, uh, if you use some generative AI services, you will find uh, their citation links are fake, and it will definitely uh, produce a lot of challenges to, for example, the uh, research integrity or academic integrity, or it will infect our scientific uh, discovery. And this, uh, the final area is the intellectual property for sure. I'm uh, currently volunteering work with Creative Commons Hong Kong chapter. I think it's a good mechanism in terms of AI age as well, because Creative Commons is sort of like, uh, I mean, licensing mechanism, it's sort of contact, contractual uh, uh, mechanism for uh, copyright. Uh, because there have been uh, some uh, litigations already in terms of generative AI services, because some generative AI are using copyrighted materials for training. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that will be a big issue to because uh, generative AI also are challenging. It, uh, they are, I mean, those services are challenging our perception of fair use in copyright law. Uh, uh, many, many, many years ago, and there was a, a very landmark case about the Google Book, Google Books, and uh, the judges thought largely thought it was sort of fair use, so it's fine. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but what, uh, what about the generative AI, AI services in the near future? Okay, I think these are three areas uh, I, I would like to quickly touch upon. Stage. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Wei Wang. We'll now hear from law researcher Eve Goman of the University of Montreal. Her research focuses on the impact of artificial intelligence on higher education, and she's currently working on that research here in Japan. Good morning, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Elin for inviting me to uh, comment on the statement that they are launching today. I would like to build upon three elements contained in the statement uh, to talk about AI, freedom, and higher education. Um, the three elements are improving teaching and learning provided at principle four, human agency and autonomy provided at principle one, and digital and information literacy provided at principle three. I'll walk through these three elements in order to make the following point. It is crucial that people who develop and deploy AI in a higher education understands it sufficiently well 
to ask relevant questions and ensure that the datafication of higher education doesn't prevent students from making important choices about their lives. Um, so let's start with enhancing learning and teaching. AI has the potential to increase, to improve the quality of education. It can help create um, personalized learning experiences. Students can learn at their own pace, focusing on their strengths or their weaknesses, um, st stuff they struggle with. Um, it can also be used to contribute positively to the students' teacher's relationship. There are some educators who um, report that they use data analytics to reach out to students uh, that are subtly um, disengaging from the classes. Um, but it is far from guaranteed. These positive impacts are far from guaranteed. Even though AI promoters say that um, personalized learning increased the retention of information, there, are, there isn't a lot of data that support that claim. Oftentimes, ed tech um, looks like modern snake, snake oil. And modern snake oil can have real negative impacts. Uh, the datification of students' lives can discourage them from engaging in meaningful, formative experiences. Um, and it's especially worrisome when we know that um, the da data starts being collected as early on primarily level and then continue following them through high school and university. Um, some students, for instance, can refrain from writing essay about controversial topics out of fear of that it might limit uh, future opportunities. Um, so they, they avoid learning the, the, the formative experience of engaging with difficult ideas, with challenging ideas. Um, college students can refuse an invitation to go to the bar on a Monday night because geolocation data can be used uh, to predict their likelihood of success as, at, at school of, or pre predict if they're at risk of dropping out. And this, it can influence their admission to grad school or their scholarship application. Uh, again, we're preventing people to engaging in meaningful uh, formative in, experiences, remember when you were in college, these are things that promote, increase human flourishing. Um, and what if immigration officer can access uh, immigrant student classes attendance data, for instance? Is it really what we want for higher education? Is it really fully promoting the full, full development of the human personality as international human rights law says it should? I don't know, I don't know. But these are questions we ought to be asking. And this is why it is so crucial that professor, university administrators understand how AI and data works so that they can ask relevant questions. What kind of data is being collected? What is it used for? Who can access it? Only professors or third parties as well? And if third parties can access it, what for? So yeah, this is what I, why I believe that the statement is so interesting and so important, and particularly principle four, one, and three, because they can contribute to protect students' freedom. That's it. Thank you, Evie. Our final panelist is Renata de Oliveira, Miranda Gomes. She is an IGF 2023 youth delegate representing Brazil who recently earned a master's degree in communication at the University of Brasilia, and she's here with us today. Welcome, Renata. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the opportunity to participate um, in this panel as a youth representative. I am part um, of the Brazilian youth delegation this year, and I... I have been studying for some time how we use internet and specifically digital pl platforms to communicate science. Um, I'll be mindful of my time here and pass to the main point that I wanted to bring to the debate and is how new digital platforms are extremely present in higher education and I believe that the COVID-19 pandemic actually showed this, um, showed us this uh, quite significantly. During a time of social isolation, we had to quickly adapt to, to a new way of learning and exchanging knowledge. Um, 
and AI was certainly uh, very much part of it. But the thing is, I believe that there is still a gap between students and educator educators when we think about the acceptancy of new platforms and ways of learning. And I'll give an example, um, which resonates a bit of, uh, uh, with what Professor Oladipo mentioned just now. Um, for example, chat GPT can be used as a tool for learning in multiple ways. And I am aware and agree with arguments that point that chat uh, GPT can facilitate like um, plag plagiarism or cutting corners when producing assignments. However, and I was discussing this with some friends um, from the Brazilian uh, delegation, that it, chat GPT can also make our lives easier. For example, at a postgraduate level, we are faced with long, long lists of reading materials. And although ChatGPT does not substitute comprehensive reading and understanding of texts, it can certainly aid um, by producing perhaps um, bullet point highlights and aid us in gaining some time, actually. So um, my, it can also be a tool to develop critical thinking and, uh, and analytical skills. So my argument here is that educators and students should work together. And the principles here presented um, are proposing to find solutions that can help all parts involved. Specifically, I wanted to point out principle number five, learning about technologies and is an experiential lifelong process. And new platforms such as AI depend much more on the users than on the software itself. So it is crucial that we educate ourselves and work collaboratively to ensure that it can be, um, that it can be the best possible. So this is why I believe that these spaces of debate are so important. In Brazil, um, the approximation between AI and education is going beyond the scope of higher education also. For example, the state of Piauí recently announced that it is working to include AI in the, state, um, the state's high school curriculum. So it will be the first state in Brazil to do so. So this is a great way to begin the dialogue of good platform usage from the initial learning processes. So I, I think this is pretty much what I had to say to bring to the debate for now, but uh, I, I, I look forward to discussing it further with you. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Renata. We do now want to engage uh, the community here with us and broaden our conversation. So we're going to open it up for questions. There are microphones at the table. Um, so the floor is yours. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Say your name and your association. Certainly, my name is Christa Tobler. I'm a professor of European Union law at two universities, Basel in Switzerland and Leiden in the Netherlands. I would like to react to the point made by the youth delegate just a moment ago. I can absolutely underwrite that. There is, in my experience, this gap in expectation. I can see that, for example, at my Dutch university, Leiden University, the law faculty at the moment is trying to formulate an I an AI policy, they've not yet quite managed it, but for the time being they said actually we are against using it. My students, of course, are from a wholly different generation, they're all digital natives, uh, they know how to use these things and they want to use them. So I can see the gap that you're talking about. And I personally, in one of my courses where people have to write an essay, have taken the approach suggested by our own um, department that deals with these matters, which has said that one way of doing it is to alert students to the possibilities and the dangers, especially in the legal field. You may all be well aware of the fact that a lot of wrong legal information is provided by these models. So you alert them to them, but you also tell them that, yes, you can use it, because it makes no sense to say no. It's just not realistic, in my opinion. So I have followed the approach of telling them, yes, you can use it, but with proper attribution. So in your papers, you have to state whether or not you have used AI and how you have used it. I think this is a better approach because, as I just said a moment ago, it's totally unrealistic to expect that people will not use it. It's also not clever because, as you said, quite rightly, there are positive elements in these systems and we should use them in a, in a positive sense. So, thank you for your contribution. Renata, I believe was your name, is entirely reflecting what I have seen in my work. Thank you. I think we had another question here, yes? Thank you very much. Um, 
This is, uh, my name is Nazmul Hassan. I came from Bangladesh. Uh, I work with an NGO called Action Aid uh, Bangladesh. So um, uh, take me liberty actually to uh, bring down a little bit of rooted of the discussion since you know I work with the community and the excluded group and marginalized communities. So I, I was thinking, you know, in, in our country there is a huge digital divide. So in between the urban and rural, uh, in addition to that even also the, in, in the different um, age groups and generations. And also based on the, their sexual identity, let's say, you know, male or female, you know, men and So I was thinking, you know, since, you know, still there is a huge digital divide. So we are talking about the AI in universities. So if it is becoming more and more a kind of um, pertinent uh, technologies in our life, so how the divide will increase uh, and how the people will be excluded and more marginalized. Some people will be, you know, so super tech people and they will be using the AIs and other technologies and getting more and more opportunities, access and rights, everything. Uh, I imagine public service will be based on AI in future. So then people like us, you know, in, in our countries, global south and living in a very interior place, how they will have their basic rights, let's say education and health and other spaces. Um, whether, you know, do we think of how the AI can be also, you know, as, as a part of our lifelong learning, you know? So sometimes we are thinking, you know, uh, technology will come, definitely we, have, we need to embrace the technology, this is for sure, but how it can be also, um, you know, people can acquire the knowledge and the skills by their lifelong learning. What are the uh, educational institutions are taking that kind of tools, curriculum, or developing that tools and curriculum for the community or the excluded group so that they are also not being left behind. Uh, they are also taking this, you know, the becoming this part of these new technologies. So um, I, I don't know who could, could reflect on that, but this is actually point came in uh, to my mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone like to react to that? Yes, Can feel I? free to open the mic. Shall I? Yes. Yeah. I, I think this is exactly what I have been talking about. The, uh, the digital divide uh, has many shades of it because it has something to do with socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, and also the nearness and the away from uh, the, the uh, towns or cities and infrastructure. And the, or those who have this infrastructure, they are uh, the ones who will benefit and those who do not have will not benefit. So the digital divide is real. In fact, there are uh, people now, they say that it has come down. It is true. It has come down as the, uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, 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 availability of uh, uh, the internet and other things in some of the remote areas, but still there are problems. And how do we, in fact, it is, that is one aspect. Second aspect is that we have something what we call the uh, algorithms that are written. The, the biases are itself, themselves reflect the kinds of uh, discrimination, exclusion, because the moment uh, the, you perpetuate them, because whether it is uh, uh, generative AI and other kinds of uh, forms are real challenge because that is where, how do we counter these biases? How do we counter these exclusions are the challenge. This is where academics have to think about alternatives of uh, this thing because one way is using the traditional medium, but the traditional medium reachability is lesser. Whereas the, uh, the technology that we have can reach large sections, but then governments have to intervene, governments have to invest, and even some of the private, uh, uh, you know, uh, firms have to invest. This is the alternative. There is no other way. Thank you. Thank you. Any final question? Yes. Yes. I think the microphone's right there. They'll turn it on for you, yeah, there. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Julia. I am a youth delegate uh, for Brazil. Well, I'm here with my colleagues, and I am uh, very proud to uh, participate in Renata's uh, and the group's uh, presentation panel. 
uh, for she is also a colleague of us in our youth delegation. Uh, but jumping to my question, uh, I asked myself during this presentation, uh, how are the participants are s see and act to work sensibility and empathy on the ethics perspective of using AI? And uh, is there a, a connection to using like different, uh, different engines for AIs, like not feeding only to a corp, like, oh, we, we will work about AI, but let's see different uh, engines and different uh, groups and corporations that have worked like the open source and the, clo and the closed uh, source engines and like diversifying because it's, uh, if, there is, if there is uh, that sense in using the, the diversity of engines to help uh, building sensibility and emphasis for the ethics uh, uh, problem. I see it as a problem because there is a lot of apathy or, unin or in uninterested uh, STEM, uh, STEM academics or STEM operators, not, not necessarily academics, only workers that are uninterested in de uh, developing and working with AI in a ethical or a moral, uh, own over ethical and moral standards. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pisanti, that is right up one of your observations. Would you like to respond to that? Yes, thank you. Uh, there are, at the last counts a few months ago, around 1,300, 1,300 ethics codes for AI around the world that have been collected. And there must be 10 times as many that have not been collected anymore. No one cares. Uh, some of them are very solid. They were built from the ground up, uh, starting from an inventory of ethical systems by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, the IEEE, which is now developing a set of standards for ethical AI that can be used by companies and governments for developing, for guiding the development of systems and for guiding the assessment of systems. One problem these have is that it's very hard First, to avoid subjectivity, you look at the whole big uh, 30 pages of uh, ethically aligned AI that is age appropriate for children. And in the end, it's a value judgment. Someone has to make a value judgment, whether something is appropriate for 13 years old and not 13 and a half years old. Uh, so that's one problem. Uh, the other one is that it's very hard to bring these codes or the law, by the way, because some people say that codes are a way to, ethical codes are a way to avoid the law, uh, not, not have the, the, the strict legal observance. But either way, it's very hard to bring this down to the person who's actually doing the coding, who's actually selecting data and saying how uh, you, uh, uh, how you actually develop the system and put data into it. Uh, that has uh, to have a large part of contribution from the universities, where in exercises we challenge our students uh, at all levels, you know, the people who are doing the hard computer science coding and so forth, and all the way to people, as was mentioned, uh, students using chat GPT for their essays. Uh, we have to work on that and uh, we cannot solve that at a university level alone. If our students arrive from high school, from pre-university education, without this ethical uh, and without a mathematical competence, uh, there's uh, a huge challenge for the universities to compensate for 18 years of non-education. This again goes to the cost of not doing. And uh, one other contribution here. Uh, as I said, I second Divina from Mike's statement of resisting the panic, but I don't only say, okay, freeze, uh, calm down. I think that we can develop tools I personally, I'm going to make, bring in a little plug for a tool I have developed, uh, which is not for AI, but can be extended, which is when you look at all the panics around the internet and also all the ways that the internet is seen as a panacea, as a save it all, you can actually see that most of the things that we either like very much or dislike very much that are happening on the internet uh, have a human social 
uh, pre-online or offline component and the disruptive, sometimes radically revolutionary change that brings through the internet. Uh, it's like phishing or Wikipedia, you know, the bad and the, the, the evil and the good. Uh, they are all either phishing is simple fraud, hugely enabled by the internet. And Wikipedia is, you know, plain human, warm hearted cooperation, the will to share knowledge made big. So we have six elements there, identity, uh, uh, scale, identity, uh, trans jurisdictional border crossing, uh, barrier lowering, friction reduction, and the management of humankind's memory and forgetfulness. We can analyze every conduct that we like or dislike online or every project, divide it into these pieces and reassemble it and then decide where do you want your ethical code? Where do you want your police? Where do you want to totally change human minds? Human minds will not, if you don't change human minds, you will not stop having fraud. You will not stop people trying to cheat people and people falling for cheats. So let's not blame the internet and let's not blame artificial intelligence uh, or it's a very small niche thing called chat GPT without looking at this broader picture. And as I said, rationally, this may be too Cartesian. We still need some fluffiness and some fuzziness, but this is the kind of tool we can have. Final point, universities can contribute to this in an institutional way. We have been providing our individual academic contributions, the technical contributions, the institutions have their own role that transcends the activism that sometimes comes with uh, situated academic social science and uh, bridge with the technical community that's actually doing all this development. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pisanti. And we couldn't agree more. And that's why we think that having uh, an articulated set of principles to begin the work of higher education, and I love Dr. Frau Miggs encouraging each organization to make it their own so we have that diversity of thinking. Um, with this set of principles. So we've reached the end of our time, and I'd like to conclude with an invitation. Please go to our webpage and see the list of signatories and consider adding your name. This will give our statement more reach and credibility. Our site will provide updates as the statement reaches new audiences and begins to influence institutions around the world. Thank you all for your participation in our event today and for your support of this important initiative. Thank you.